Hello fellow future enthusiasts. On Demystifying, we do deep dives on science, futurism, and speculative technology. My name is Thor, and I will be your host today. Given the pace of technological advancement, we're beginning to seriously ask the question, is it possible that humans will utilize fusion propulsion in space before we build our first commercial fusion power plants? At first, the notion might seem overly ambitious. Fusion is known foremost for being elusive and complex, and harnessing it for power generation is hard enough. Should we really be concerned with trying to press novel technology into propulsion applications? Well, as the science will tell, fusion engines may be new, but they are well understood, and becoming more attractive by the day as legacy rockets continue to restrict our ability to explore space. In the 1968 article Interstellar Transport, published in Physics Today, Freeman Dyson discusses increasing the thrust and exhaust velocity of Orion's fission propulsion by switching to deuterium-tritium fusion. If you don't know what Project Orion was, you can watch our series on the channel about it, linked below. This was the first time a serious propulsion concept utilizing nuclear fusion was envisioned, even though it was just a modification of a fission design. About five years later, the British Interplanetary Society carried forward the fusion rocket legacy with the Daedalus concept. By the end of the decade, several iterations of the Daedalus vehicle were compiled, an interstellar craft using confined fusion pellets in a pulsed electron pump system. This is really where the legacy of fusion propulsion outside of fiction and Project Orion begins, with a massive vehicle carrying immense stores of fuel for interstellar travel. The first step towards a practical fusion engine would come about 20 years later based on laboratory fusion instruments. The QED, or Quiet Energetic Dense System, would provide the foundational science needed to validate later fusion engines. Robert Bussard suggested the QED system in the 1990s, a type of linear arc jet designed to test the behavior of high-density plasmas. The QED-1, assembled at UCLA, could produce a 0.6-ton magnetic field and ion temperatures of 15 electron volts by firing a stream of ions into a chamber of concentric magnetic hoops. The QED was succeeded by the more well-known Princeton Field Reversed Configuration System, or PFRC, variants of which have been experimented with from 2008 to today. The evolution of this device would serve to sustain the theories necessary for adapting such a fusion system for spacecraft propulsion. After the QED concept was validated, Robert Bussard went on to write proposals using a QED-derived engine capable of traversing between atmospheric, vacuum, and even interstellar mediums. More importantly, QED and PFRC-derived engines are theoretically small enough to allow conventional spacecraft to carry them. Comparing recent advances in fusion with the historical advent of fission can be done to highlight the differences between applications of these reactions. In 1942, the first nuclear pile was constructed underneath the University of Chicago, providing a solid foundation for nuclear fission power well before nuclear propulsion or even weapons were developed. Achieving fission is resource-intensive, but once you have acquired the necessary material, achieving fission is really as simple as piling up bricks of moderator and fissile material. I can't stress that enough, fission is extremely easy. No repulsive forces or high voltages are needed. Fusion is a very different beast. It requires large amounts of energy provided by electron guns, lasers, or strong magnetic fields. In engineering terms, there are almost no similarities between fusion and fission, besides the need to shield neutrons from the operator. These magnetic fields are very important in fusion. They contain the high-energy plasma in order to ignite fusion. In a power-generating reactor, all plasma is being contained to reach ignition most efficiently. But in a fusion engine, the pressure produced by plasma in the reactor is allowed to vent and can even be shaped to provide better thrust. While fission can occur in a shirt-sleeve environment on Earth without complications, fusion is highly dependent on pressure and temperatures. Space is the ideal environment to sustain efficient fusion reactions because of the low temperatures and vacuum. So, how do we get thrust out of a fusion engine? In theory, there are two ways, neutrons and plasma pressure. Although current generation designs only use plasma pressure, we will look at both methods. Fusion produces fast neutrons, which must be decelerated by a massive material. 
Now, recall neutrons do not have charge, so they cannot be interacted with via magnetic fields. Well, technically the particle's spin can be affected by these fields, but this is of limited use to us in propulsion. The only fields we know influence neutrons are gravity and nuclear forces in the quantum scale. A free neutron emanating from a fusion reaction transfers energy through elastic collisions with atomic nuclei which have similar mass as the free neutron, so atoms with low atomic numbers are ideal for receiving the momentum of neutrons. Fusion generates neutrons with a lot of velocity though, so we must decelerate the neutron flux before sampling its momentum via elastic collisions. Slowing neutrons is usually done with heavy metals, and absorbing momentum of neutrons is done with low-mass elements, such as hydrogen. Altogether, neutrons contribute only slightly to overall thrust because they are not charged. Because of this, neutrons are seen as undesirable in current engine designs. Plasma pressure is the primary mechanism responsible for thrust, and can be optimized by altering the magnetic fields making up the rocket's throat and nozzle. As fusion occurs in the reaction chamber, large amounts of energy are generated which accelerate some of the fusion plasma against the magnetic fields containing it. By allowing plasma to escape in one direction, thrust is produced. Space is especially conducive for fusion in general, as we've said. Its low temperature allows superconductors to operate without cryogenics, and the lack of an atmosphere simplifies maintaining a ducted reaction chamber. Before we move forward, we need to look at some of the broad requirements for fusion engines and the unique characteristics of these systems. Requirements for engines we build will involve missions, payload, mass ratios, and trip times. Larger payloads and longer missions tend to require larger, more powerful engines. This makes sense for all engines, not just fusion ones. Unique characteristics of fusion engines include mass properties of the vehicle, power output, plasma jet power, and thrust. These can vary significantly depending on the design. The goal is to maximize the efficiency of energy conversion from a power plant to the plasma jet, then into thrust. Each step along this process, of course, introduces inefficiencies. Keep in mind, fusion for power production requires you breed the needed materials in not insignificant amounts. Deuterium, helium-3, tritium, etc. This is mostly an issue in power production. Fusion plants must breed enough fusion fuel to maintain themselves as commercial facilities, so fuel must be constantly produced. This is not the case with rockets, clearly. Expanding production of fusion fuels is certainly possible and probably, if not definitely, inevitable, but for now we can easily meet the needs of engines without drastically changing our fusion fuel production scale on Earth. Fusion for propulsion is likely to be developed in a similar or shorter time frame as commercial fusion power, depending on the amount of financial backing these ideas receive. This shouldn't be a surprise though, since funding is historically the greatest barrier in all fusion-related research, unfortunately. To deploy fusion propulsion via the private sector, potential shareholders will need to identify two features of any propulsion fusion companies. A fusion technology viable for propulsion, uh, in terms of efficiency, cost, and fuel availability. And a company which can manage research and development, with confidence in the owners and the manufacturing capabilities of the company. So as soon as a fusion company earns the confidence of investors, I would argue, we'll start seeing orbital tests of fusion engines. Technology is not the obstacle here. Princeton Satellite Systems is a startup drawing from the satellite industry's talent, with over 20 years of experience. They're developing miniature fusion engines for deployment on current space vehicle architectures. PSS is also marketing a set of software tools for designing fusion engines and planning missions using them. This cooperative activity lowers the barrier of entry for all private industries considering using fusion engines. Based in the UK and founded in 2011, the company Pulsar Fusion has developed commercial Hall effect ion thrusters, and most recently began work in 2022 on a fusion drive system they hope to test in orbit once funding is secured. Pulsar Fusion seeks to use deuterium-helium-3 fusion, which produces protons and helium instead of neutrons. This is known as an aneutronic mode of fusion. 
This is a clear advantage, since excess neutrons can be seen as problematic in current fusion engines, for reasons we've already mentioned. Helicity Space is a fusion startup founded in 2018, which has earned research projects from the Department of Energy, and offers an interesting design using what is known as Magneto-Inertial Fusion, or MIF. MIF compresses multiple plasma streams into a helical thread of plasma between passive magnetic coils. Small MIF systems can achieve fusion gains, and larger ones may use ignition, making them useful at all scales. Pulsar Fusion and Princeton Satellite Systems focus on the Direct Fusion Drive, or DFD, approach, so today we'll mostly look at this method. The DFD design originates from development work on the aforementioned QED and PFRC designs. Without going into too much technical detail, we can identify the most useful information we're looking for. What is the minimum size of a DFD? What is the power consumption? And how much fuel is needed? Working through each question will help us understand how a Fusion DFD system could be flown on a current generation launch vehicle. The testbed systems used to validate the DFD concept, such as QED and PFRC, represent the practical minimum size of a modern fusion engine. That is to say, proposals based on these systems are about 30 to 100 meters long, about the size of a Falcon Heavy on the pad. Notably though, this includes the total vehicle size, including the power plant, not just the engine. A vehicle at the larger end of this range would necessarily be built in orbit. Pulsar Fusion, for example, plans on three launches followed by orbital assembly. Each component could be lofted on a Falcom Heavy or equivalent, resulting in a 100 meter long vehicle capable of interplanetary travel. Pulsar advertises a forecasted engine size of about 10 by 4 by 4 meters, smaller than a tractor trailer. Power use varies substantially depending on many factors. The type and method of fusion matters the most, so we'll assume electron pumped deuterium tritium fusion has been declined in favor of a neutronic microwave pumped deuterium helium 3 fusion. Again, this system is based loosely on an electrode microwave discharge QED system. The only downside is that a neutronic fusion needs higher temperatures to achieve ignition and thus more power. Deuterium tritium needs about 100 million Kelvin, while deuterium helium 3 ignition occurs at 400 million Kelvin and fuses at 1.6 billion Kelvin. The unique combination of hot plasma and magnetic reconnection available to direct drive fusion systems means achieving these temperatures is possible even today. It's difficult to pin down the power draw of these engines, because in an applied system the engine is always providing power to the vehicle. After all, these engines are modified fusion reactors. An engine producing between 10 and 100 newtons of thrust should produce power in the megawatt magnitude. Yet, the vehicle will still need a generator to meet power needs, and a compact fission reactor will provide more than enough power to start the engine. Fuel is injected into the DFD drive in a stream, where the fusion products heat the fuel before allowing it to expand in the nozzle area. While fuel consumption is important, since fusion fuels are very expensive right now, the reason we're talking about it is to illustrate why fuel supply is more of an economic issue than an engineering one. At the National Ignition Facility, about 40 megajoules of fuel are used per fusion pulse. Deuterium-helium-3 fusion produces in the ballpark of 350 terajoules per kilogram. Any theoretical DFD Starship we build will not be limited in any way by its fuel mass budget, instead competing with other fusion industries to reserve enough fuel for ambitious missions. Once again, the scale of fuel production is the key obstacle, as seems to be a common theme in fusion. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please like and comment to help push the video through the algorithm, and also subscribe if you'd like to see more content like this. Thank you.